There's going to be situations that you can't control and things that are going to get a little bit dicey. And uh, there's a few different ways you can approach that. You can say, okay, I'm going to, you know, hit the eject button and get out of Dodge, or I'm going to lean in and fix the problem. I'm Magenta Strongheart, and you're listening to The Bomb. Continuing our theme of Design Labs community, this week our guest is president and co-founder of OpenMV and lead embedded systems engineer at Embark Trucks, Kwabena Ajiman. Today, Kwabena and I revisit his 2016 Hackaday Supercon talk, kickstarting computer vision with the OpenMV, discuss the Hackaday origins of OpenMV, and get a status update on how the startup is doing today. As a bit of info for our audience, OpenMV makes low-power microcontroller boards which allow users to easily implement applications using machine vision in the real world, which basically means OpenMV makes it possible for students and hobbyists to build simple robots that can track colored objects or faces. In fact, our first guest on the bomb, Jay Moss, uses OpenMV in his robot, Helen. OpenMV originated as a Hackaday semifinalist, so it's very near and dear to our hearts, and we are so excited to hear how the company has grown since then. So excited to catch up today and learn more about how everything's going, and uh, let's get into it. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about your origin story? Did you always know you were going to be a founder, entrepreneur, or engineer, or how did you sort of get to where you are today with all of these things? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, my origin starts with Legos, like many kids. Uh, I had the ability to read the instruction manual and follow the steps. And um, also being given access to like computers and other things to take apart when I was a kid. And that kind of fostered that curiosity for um, just technical things. Um, I don't think, though, the spark was really lit until um, one of my friends, Marco, back in high school, he gave... Uh, he was playing around with basic electronics and I'd never seen these types of things and he showed me what he was doing and it blew my mind. And then the thing I wanted, the only thing I wanted was to get access to Forrest Mims III, uh, his um, Radio Shack basic electronics kit. Oh, sick. <laughs> and once I got that, um, that was amazing just to be able to build different circuits and play with different things. And then did you know from there what you wanted to pursue already as far as electronics or were you still dabbling in different kinds of engineering fields? Um, I think from that, I mean, you just get that excitation and you're just like, I'm all in. I want to make this happen. I want to make it work. And so I started buying college era textbooks, uh, well, college level textbooks, just because uh, the, the information that was hobbyist at that point, the hobbyist information online was very thin. Right. Um, and it was hard to figure out what things were. It wasn't, uh, you know, this is right when Arduino was kind of getting started. And so this whole revolution and telling people how like complex circuits worked and et cetera, that was not, a, that was not in existence online. Mm -hmm. And so you really needed to like find a textbook that actually right. told you how complex circuits worked. Um, in particular, if you wanted to figure out like what did a transistor actually do and how did it work? Like um, the, the electronics books for kids, the, uh, the Radio Shack one, uh, it gave you some information, but it was always hard to figure out what can I build more with this basic building block because you didn't understand enough about the circuit um, mm -hmm. to actually really uh, build anything bigger than what kind of like few examples they showed you. Right. Um, and then I think the second thing that really ignited me was uh, during high school, I managed to get an internship at a company called Pryogenifix, which did liquid nitrogen special effects for nightclubs. Um, so weirdly enough, I got to go visit every nightclub in Miami. Wow. Very cool. Um, DJ slash liquid nitrogen operator, the yeah. dream title that everyone Yes. Wants yes. That's the dream title. Um, but got started with the basic stamp actually. And that's how I got into microcontrollers. Wow. That is an awesome story. And I <laughs> had no idea. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I'm always curious what, um, 3d modeling software we're using at the time. You mentioned CAD oh, and I was wondering because. I'm like, AutoCAD? Okay, nice. I wouldn't a say classic. it was 3D modeling software. It was okay. 2D at okay. that time. Okay, got it. <laughs> For those who may not know, CAD, Computer Aided Design, is the use of computer-based software to aid in design processes such as 3D modeling mechanical designs or schematics for printed circuit boards. Let's fast forward a little bit. What were you studying in university? And then walk us through how that got you to OpenMV and starting your own company. Um. I think the biggest thing for me was my professor, James Seho. 
what I had to do is I had to go find a professor to work with and they gave me a list of professors and the one I emailed, I, I wanted to email it and talk to the guy who was doing digital logic design and that was James C. Ho. And he turned out to be the uh, assistant dean actually. And so I had a, you know, a good communication to the system dean, at, well, the uh, assistant dean at that point. Yeah. And um, he helped me pay for a propeller chip. Um, so I'm a Parallax fanboy uh, back in the day, at least when I got started. And uh, I got the propeller chip and I started writing all kinds of drivers for that. And they still kind of are online to, to help people. And I've had, you know, tens of thousands of downloads of the drivers that I've written. In particular, uh, I wrote things like the VGA output driver directly, you know, using the chip to generate a screen. And that was really cool to do. Um, did one that plays audio files, records audio files. Uh, did one that, mon you know, makes I squared, well, makes the PS2 bus work for a PS2 mouse and keyboard. Um, and then also wrote something that actually talks to an SD card and does the entire FAT file system. And that was all during your graduate career? Uh, undergraduate. Undergraduate career, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kind of wish, honestly, I had spent more time hanging out, though, except, but I needed to level up. I guess it, it kind of landed me where I'm at right now. If I hadn't spent that time uh, really honing my skill and becoming good at what I was doing, then I wouldn't you know, be where I'm at today. So it, it's all for the good. Right. Carnegie Mellon, their motto is, uh, my heart is in the work. So it was a good place for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by writing all those drivers, I got a lot of knowledge of assembly. So uh, to do all that stuff on the propeller chip, uh, they have two different modes of coding, something called spin, which is similar to C, and then something called, and then you have their uh, assembly language. And the designer of the chip, uh, frankly, uh, you're supposed to code in assembly. He, he was not, he didn't try to make you shy away from that. Uh, but what he tried to do was make it such that the assembly was easy to separate different parts of it into. Modular in some sort of way. Yeah, like yeah. Um, but uh, once you got past the barrier of, oh my god, I have to program an assembly, and then you decided, oh, I'll program an assembly, then you really unlock some crazy features in the chip, um, all kinds of cool things you can do. Uh, what's, what's interesting about learning to program in that way is that it's super unforgiving, and so you get really good at mentally completely assembling what is going on in your head, mm -hmm. and then knowing how to pick out uh, the particular problem. Uh, because a lot of the stuff that you would do in the propeller chip, if you're like doing VGA output, you can't debug it unless you have a, like a really high speed fancy oscilloscope that can look at the whole VGA output waveform, which is a complex waveform. Uh, there's no way you can debug. So it's either your code works or it doesn't. The way things move from there is from the propeller chip knowledge and my knowledge as undergraduate, I started working on uh, something called the CMU cam where I used a propeller chip to uh, do basic computer vision. And this was meant to replace something called the CMU Cam uh, 3, which was on the market at the time. A fun fact, CMU Cams were originally designed by Quibena's alma mater, Carnegie Mellon University. While other digital cameras typically use a much higher bandwidth connector, the CMU Cam's lightweight interface allows it to be accessed by microcontrollers and supports simple image processing and color blob tracking, making rudimentary computer vision capable in systems that would previously have far too little power to do such a thing. The CMU Cam also has an extremely small form factor. For these reasons, it's relatively popular for making small, mobile robots. And so back when it came out in 2002, it was very revolutionary since no one had ever tried doing that. Um, fast forward, uh, I came out of the CMU Cam 4 in 2011. Um, we sold about a thousand units and it was a nice and tight system, about 8,000 lines of code that could take pictures, it could do color tracking, uh, run at 30 FPS and it was performant. Um, managed to do some insane hacks to get some speed boost. Um, I, I think I used up literally every single MIP on the processor, like it was the timing deadline maybe was a few instructions before it completed its normal run. So I pushed the system incredibly hard it's to limits. get it to work, <laughs> um, which is good, though. When you can do that with a microcontroller, it's really satisfying to kind of make a digital system able to do what it's maximally right, capable. Right, maximum efficiency. Yeah. Um, anyway, moving on from that. So uh, graduate school, went to work at Oracle Corporation as a computer chip designer. Working there, I had plenty of time to explore uh, new projects. And so I actually got into the OpenMV cam by hackadaya.io. They had a project website. Mm -hmm. And so on that project website, I was bored one day and scrolling and uh, the OpenMV cam came up uh, because the company was originally created by my 
my partner, uh, Ibrahim, and uh, he was looking for uh, a partner at that time to help him kind of take the project to the next level. And so that's when I joined. And did he have plans um, at that point in the project to enter into Hackaday Prize or he just was looking for partners to develop the project and then you all entered? Well, um, before the Hackaday Prize, that was a little bit before. Okay. Um, what we were trying to do is, uh, well, they had a Kickstarter. So the reason why I found the Open Cam was that it had the most skulls and most likes on mm -hmm. Hackaday at the time. It was the top project. Right, most activity. Yep. And so I thought this was cool. And then I looked into it more and realized that Ibrahim had actually built his idea off my CMU Cam 4 idea. Yeah, small world. yeah, yeah. He looked at my CMU Cam 4 and was like, I could do it better. <laughs> and, You're like, I got to meet this guy. Yeah, I got to meet him. And so we got connected and I jumped in to help out. And that's when uh, we, we had to get through a big fiasco, which was the, um, the manufacturing runs that were done for the first uh, 1,000 OpenMV cams, the OpenMV cam uh, version 2. Mm -hmm. The version 1 never went, uh, it never really saw the light of day. It was about 100 units produced. Here's a clip from Quebena's 2016 Hackaday Supercon talk, kickstarting computer vision with the OpenMV. This talk is about overcoming failure. Um, like in every story arc, there needs to be some rising action, some conflict, some failure. In OpenMB cam story, we chose the wrong camera chip to go into mass production with. And how did it happen? Well, it turns out that the uh, camera chips have little tiny solder balls in the bottom of them, which uh, go bad over time. So uh, unless they're uh, completely temperature sealed, so completely uh, sealed from the outside world in a humidity protected environment, uh, the solder balls corrode. They rust, and after 10 years, they're completely worthless. There's no way you can actually put the camera down on the PCB board anymore. So we actually made Hackaday's Fail of the Week because of this. Someone gave an anonymous tip, and bam, our failure was on front page of Hackaday. So be careful where you're sourcing your parts. You may not get what you expect. So at the beginning of this year, the situation was bad for our Kickstarter. We had about 18K of cash on hand from the 100K initially allocated. We had built up 150 open MV cams, so for 80% failure rate on them. And of course, these cams were not really repairable. We had 1,450 bad PCBs, and we had another 500 bad camera modules on top of the 1,450 camera modules we hadn't soldered on. So we had about 2,000 camera modules that were worthless. This was a write-off of about 10K, pretty much. Last but not least, we had 900 disappointed backers who could easily turn into an angry mob if we didn't eventually get something out to them. So these were dark days. The way we were able to get through that was that we actually shared our, our current status with everybody. We made sure to let people know what was going on, and then we put extra effort into improving the product to make it better than it was. So hopefully people were getting something even better yes. um, than what they had mm -hmm. originally signed up for. Yeah. That's clever and, and makes sense. Now yeah. I want to be clear, um, the first version of the Open MV Cam was liquid garbage. <laughs> uh, it was a trash fire. But, you know, after six years of constant R&D, the product's quite good now. So, what did I learn? First, you need to get the community, obviously, as I said before, involved in whatever project you're doing from day one. Second, you're going to need grit to do the Kickstarter project. Also, make sure you're passionate about what you do, again, because you'll need that to have that kind of grit to go on and forth and make your product. Verify your manufacturing in small steps and try to get up to a large bulk order. That way, you can make sure that nothing goes wrong in the, in the process. Also, updating your Kickstarter constantly and being transparent as possible makes a huge difference. We were lucky not to get besieged by a bunch of angry email messages because we updated every two weeks. Discuss a little bit more as far as your insights throughout that journey and why, you know, it's important to fail forward and what, you know, you've discussed how important also problem solving has been, which I think is something that most engineers and creative technologists and folks who are creating things can relate to. Remind us of some of those points you brought up in your talk and also how you see those things tying into your work even today, you know, failing forward and the importance of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good way of talking about things, failing forward. Um, yeah, I mean, what that comes down to is recognizing that there's going to be situations that you can't control and things that are going to get a little bit dicey. 
And uh, there's a few different ways you can approach that. You can say, okay, I'm going to, you know, hit the eject button and get out of dodge, or I'm going to lean in and fix the problem. And I've seen this at play so many times where, um, you know, even for OpenMV, we, we actually started out with multiple co-founders and, um, uh, you know, uh, when, when things got tough, uh, not everyone stayed around, which uh, made it challenging. Anything else you want to mention as far as where OpenMV is at today? Yeah, yeah. So right now we're kind of uh, in an in-between point. Uh, I think the pandemic has been, it, it's actually been really challenging, but also at the same time, a, a time for growth. It was a chance to actually work on the software and really improve things. So over the pandemic, um, we met a performance optimizer and we put him to work. And so, so many things in our code were just not the best. And just like, we, we basically have a two to three X faster processor. Wow. No, more than that, like four X faster <laughs> processor, yeah. thanks to all the optimizations we've done. Um, in particular, uh, stuff like going through all our entire library, fixing all of our kernels for doing image manipulation. Um, sometimes one of them got a 16x boost, which is a thousand percent faster, which is and just embarrassing on how much he improved the, core, the speed of that. Um, we redid our entire camera driver. So previously the OpenMV cam could not hit the maximum FPS of a camera. And now it's capable of achieving the max frame rate of a camera. And this is, uh, Typically, if you see any microcontroller project, uh, what our camera driver is beyond performant. Um, it's pretty much hits the level of like professional quality code. Yeah. Um, and even, well, even higher than that, like we pushed it to the max in terms of the data rates that we're able to handle now um, is, is, is high. And we're also able to actually, we have a nice unique memory architecture, which lets you do really cool things like you can actually tell the OpenMV cam to do slow-mo where you can speed a camera sensor up to like a very high frame rate and then set up an image FIFO and DRAM to capture like a second. And then you wow. can actually like swipe your hand in front of it with our global shutter camera and you can get slow-mo effects with the camera. Very cool. Um, and so to get that, you know, you have to have a really fast, tightly coded architecture mm -hmm. um, that's capable of capturing all those frames in one go without dropping any. You've spoken passionately about, um, even as part of that talk we mentioned, um, is accessibility and sort of open source hardware, right? And could you tell us a little bit more about what, you know, why you feel it's important to make these tools accessible um, and why it's a part of OpenMV's, you know, philosophy? Well, you know, OpenMV was uh, one of the kind of things we're trying to do is just to raise the bar and what people could think was possible. So I, we've accomplished that, you know, in significant ways. Uh, as I said before, um, before we got started on working out what we're doing, if you look back historically, no one thought microcontrollers can do camera. The only company that was forward thinking on this was ST Microelectronics. And even then they didn't expect their processor to be able to do much. I think they just added the camera functionality because one random customer wanted it for some weird thing, but otherwise it was a joke. Um, and truly, if you looked at the software examples and what the capabilities were, it was a joke. Um, the images and the frame rate and what you could do and capture were barely anything. But thanks to kind of the software development we've done and the kinds of things we've pulled off, it really blew people's minds, in particular at ST, that these things are possible. Um, you know, they're, you know, we're in, we're in good communication with them now because they've seen what we've been able to push the STM 32H7 to do, which is, you know, some applications that people didn't think it could do. Um, and then you also see things like NXP, you know, directly thinking about they have an IMX processor that was designed with computer vision as a forethought versus being something that wasn't put into it. Even ESP32 uh, came out with, uh, I remember going to Hackaday and meeting some folks there and they were thinking about, oh, we should add you know, camera support to their you know, processor. Um, and, and now you see it everywhere, like microcontrollers are coming out of cameras and um, there's middleware packages for these, and a lot of times people are leveraging our code, like we've seen our drivers all over the place in other people's products. Um, you know, not attributed, but uh, still, that we made it open source, so, you know, yeah. people can do what they want with it. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's always good for people to hear. It's something we talk about a lot, of course, with Hackaday, um, but 
to hear that you can have a successful business and still be open source. You know, I think a lot of people, it's not intuitive. They're like, no, I have to hide, you know, my work and that sort of thing. But there's been plenty of successful companies, you know, that have open source oh, designs and things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's important to understand you have to really add value in what you're bringing. Um, if you're making open source software where you're just like reusing, you know, 90 or 99 percent of whatever. Um, yeah, that's maybe you might want to open that up because you're going to get cloned real hard um, if you're successful. But if you're really building something that is really aggressively new and uh, something that people haven't done before and that has an extreme technical depth, then there is an opportunity for that. Um, but you have to think about what those, you know, opportunities are going to be and the things you're going to work on. It, it always kind of needs to bend towards the esoteric. Um, so it's not for everybody, I would say. But if you have something you're passionate about, some kind of like me was computer vision on microcontrollers, which is a very different environment from desktops. Um, you know, if you're into audio processing, for example, and doing crazy things with audio filters, that's another, you know, domain you can get into. Um, I can't say I don't have like all the ideas in my head, but if you can kind of push yourself towards developing something which is very unique, then there's an opportunity there to build that ecosystem. Right. Absolutely. And on that note, what sort of advice do you have for folks who maybe do have something they're passionately working on, but find the kind of startup world very intimidating? Or would you even recommend getting into the startup world now that you've been in it, you know, as long as you have? Or do you say people should run and do something else, you know, but if they are interested in making their passion, you know, more of a full time job, what kind of recommendations do you have or advice to get through that door not be so yeah intimidating it can be an intimidating world i think yeah i mean i'll be straight uh with everyone here so something i've learned which has been really valuable for me working at embark trucks is the concept of a total addressable market uh this is some vc like talk deep talk it's not going to be sexy but this is what it comes down to life will be harder for you if you target something that has a small market and if you are targeting something with a small market, a lot of people aren't interested in funding it, supporting it, and many other things. And it makes your journey a lot harder. Um, Embark Trucks, for example, is a company that uh, I work for. And, um, you know, we're targeting a effectively $1 trillion market. And so that meant it was easy for our startup to raise money. You right. still had to work hard for it, but it meant that people could open their wallets. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers were there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, if you target something like, so OpenMV makes sense as a, a side hustle, and I think you could work it harder. Um, there's people at Arducam, for example, who have worked it very hard and they're doing well. Um, they're targeting more of a hardware niche in terms of providing all the necessary sensors to the Raspberry Pi and making sure things that Raspberry Pi doesn't do, like kind of like, a, you know, some people buy, supporting Apple by selling things that iPhones don't have. Right. Um, you know, they found a huge market, which is, oh, people like the Raspberry Pi. And then they started selling things to support that market. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how you can build a successful company. Uh, the way that OpenMV is being run right now is more of a intellectual exploration of what is possible. And so it's creating its own kind of new market category. This is way harder. And... If you plan on doing something like that, you might want to have a day job. That's all I'll say about it. Um, if you're not targeting a giant total addressable market, then it'll be way harder to be successful just because you're not going to get the sales that you need. But if you want to be creative and build something that is, uh, for me, OpenMV is like an artistic expression. Um, in particular, my art is optimizing things and making it go fast. Uh, then that's a different consideration. And you should have different motivations for doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well put. Since our, our name is The Bomb, we're talking about bill of materials. What would you say is your personal bill of materials to get you started and get you going Monday through Friday, get you out of bed? And yeah. you can interpret this however you want. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I encourage everybody to really take care of their health. And remember, that's tied to your ability to work and execute. Um, Go to the gym. It's a life transforming process. I used to be much skinnier, uh, but then I took a powerlifting class and just got into picking up heavy weights and started developing muscle. And um, 
you know, uh, life has really become a lot better by just, you know, really leaning in and saying, okay, every day I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to eat right, I'm going to work out, I'm going to prepare for the day. Uh, this then ties into helping you get sleep, um, yes. which is very valuable. And and then from that, you can, you, you really think better, you're, you're more clear on what you're thinking about. Um, it, it makes it so much easier to run a marathon then because so many things in life, it's not one and done, but it's years of development and work and you see the result and you're like, wow, how'd you get there so quickly? But it, it really is a long and slow process. Yeah. And so you really need to prepare and just, you know, make sure to include that ingredient of self care in your life. Absolutely. I'm so glad you bring that up. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's absolutely like a pro tip. It's something I'm been working on and thank you so much Quabena. I really appreciate you making the time. I know you're super busy and I think that um, you really just dropped some golden nuggets today so I really appreciate it and we're super excited to have you as one of our early guests on the bomb podcast. So thanks again for joining us and if there's any anything else you want to plug go ahead and as your chance otherwise we'll wrap it up here. Yeah we're hiring an Embark Trucks. Yes Submit your resume. don't forget. <laughs> All right there you go. We're back for another Design Lab debrief with my, my colleagues Giovanni Salinas, our product development engineer, and Bruce Dominguez, our rapid prototyping technician here at Design Lab. I think we were discussing uh, a product that Google created that we're going to be using for our Challenge 5 wildcard Design Lab builds project. Yes, it's a very exciting project. So what we're doing now is we are trying to develop a fruit or vegetable or anything for that matter sorter you know those fruit sorters that they have in the agriculture industry they're huge they're, they're big they cost millions of dollars now what they're really for industrial applications exactly and they can sort a whole truck in just minutes right but for small manufacturers small producers they don't have access to that kind of technology. And we're trying to design this system where they can train a model and let the model know, you know what, this is a good potato, this is a bad potato, and this is a small one, this is a big one. Bad potato, I'm yes. a bad potato. <laughs> and once the, the model is trained, then they can, you know, using a funnel or something like that, which is what we're doing right now, trying to figure out the, the best way, uh, drop their day's worth of um, produce and have this machine sort the, the vegetables based on, on that learning model. Hopefully saving them some time and money. Saving them time and money and making accurate uh, interpretations of the products. And, you know, these ideas can get really crazy really quick. We, right now, we're trying to make it, uh, we're trying to simplify it. So we're using just th three values, small fruit, medium-sized fruit, and large. But we've talked to people like Marco Tarabini, he was telling us the other day how chefs are training models on what a good focaccia how a good focaccia looks like. I know we are arguing about there's no way to ever train them to be able to identify a good risotto. Or and make risotto, risotto maybe is not um, something that you could ever categorize. Achievable. <laughs> but that has huge implications for the food industry, you know? So, right. yeah, it's a very interesting times ahead in terms of what we're going to ask the technology to, to do for us. When you were saying this, these projects can get really crazy really fast. I thought you actually meant like the design lab builds and what Magenta asks of you for these projects can get really crazy really fast. But you meant just the parameters for training the machine, which is also true. Exactly, because we're trying to think in terms of, yeah, let's just sort this any given vegetable. But other people are using them to sort focaccia. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm waiting for it to sort all the nuts and bolts that I've got. Yes, we jars. need that at Design Lab. <laughs> like, And then be able to tell the thread size. But that's, that's the thread future. size. Maybe yeah. that's our next project. Billion dollar idea. Yep. So this came up with Jay, which was it was a cool full circle moment in our you know, three episodes of podcast so far, so it's still exciting. But full circle now. Yes. <laughs> um was, doing spirals. Right. So was spirals. that 
Jay actually uses OpenMV products in his robots. And OpenMV is, of course, Quabena's uh, company. So Jay was talking about one of the robots he created was to identify if people approaching him were wearing a mask or not. And that uses the OpenMV component and technology. And I remember Jay talking about it's important for these technologies to become more accessible because ultimately then more diverse group of designers and engineers and makers will be utilizing this tech and informing how the products that are utilizing this tech are applied. And that's important because there have been instances with products with camera vision that have probably not had a diverse group of people looking at the user testing or the experience because they didn't recognize certain skin tones or certain forms that were necessary for the product to function. And so I think that's another part that really excites me and you know makes me hopeful for the future of this technology is that if it's more accessible, there's more designers and engineers with a variety of backgrounds making products with this and they're able to then hopefully we'll have less of these situations where a product doesn't work for a certain type of person. As we've mentioned, Quabena's OpenMV project really took off after being a Hackaday Prize finalist, which is such an awesome example of what's possible when you enter the Hackaday Prize and get some bootstrap money, meet some people to build your team with, and really take your project to the next level. So speaking of the Hackaday Prize, you know we have to put in a shameless plug here. We just wrapped up Challenge 2, Reuse, Recycle, Revamp, and posted our finalists for that challenge. And we're now into Challenge 3, Hack It Back. We also just published a video of our Design Lab Build CO2 monitor which takes an old fan and gives it new purpose. And so if you're interested in that, definitely check it out and check out Hackaday Prize at prize.supplyframe.com to learn more and maybe enter your own work into it. Thanks so much, Gio and Bruce, for chatting. I'm excited to cover our next interview next week with Kate McAndrew. Yeah, thanks, Magenta. Thanks, Magenta. Thanks so much for listening to The Bomb. We'll see you next week where we speak with VC investor Kate McAndrew about an exciting new fund. If you like The Bomb, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow Supply Frame and Hackaday on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and Design Lab at Supply Frame Design Lab on Instagram and Twitter. The Bomb is a Supply Frame podcast written, produced, and edited by Frank Driscoll and co-edited by Daniel Ferreira. Executive producers are Ryan Tillotson and Tyler Nielsen. Theme music is by Anna Hogbin with show art by Thomas Schneider. Special thanks to Giovanni Salinas, Bruce Dominguez, Thomas Woodward, Jin Kumar, Jordan Clark, Matt Gunn, the entire Supply Frame team, and you, our wonderful listeners. I'm your host, Magenta Strongheart.